Welcome to church, everybody. As you can see, I'm in an unfamiliar place. For those of you that are watching at home, I'm in my office and I'm bringing the Word of God to all of you. A big shout out to everybody who's watching. Hello, New York City. What's up, Wilkett? Hello, New Milford Online for the next two weeks, and then we'll be back in action on the 14th and 15th of November for our special offering weekend. Be prayerful about that. I believe God is going to use it in a special way. If you have your Bible, wherever you're watching from, go ahead and grab it. Let me see if I got mine. I don't think I have mine, so we're going to use this as my Bible. I got all my my notes right here, so I got my Bible scriptures there. Hold it up nice and high. (laughs) Say it out loud with me. This is my Bible. It is my primary source of spiritual nourishment. I will read it every day and become all that God wants me to be. My mind will be renewed. My life will be transformed. I will become fully surrendered to Christ. Therefore, I will hide his word in my heart so I can be all God's destined me to be. I know you sound great wherever you're watching from. Would you remain standing, even if you're at home, stand in honor of God's word? Jude chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Little book in the Bible. Hard to find. Find Revelation. Back up just one, and you'll find the book of Jude. Jude chapter number 1, verse number 1. The scripture says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now that we got that out of the way, he's going to hit them hard. He said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God, Jesus Christ. Here we stand just a few days before what is perhaps the most contentious election in American history. Everywhere you look, there is mudslinging, there is power grabbing, there is lying, there is posturing, there is fake news. There's all sorts of stuff going on and people are vested and they are vigilant in their opinion about who should be president and why they are voting for that particular person. And this contentious culture, as you are well aware, aware of has found its way past just regular people into the body of Christ who is just as hype about this election as anyone else. And I understand. I know what people feel are at stake. And uh, with that at heart, I want to spin, if you will. I want to minister to you on something that I'm hoping is going to allow you to get spiritually hype. And just as spiritually hype, about the things of God as we are about this election. And I'm calling this message, hey Jude, pretty clever, huh? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you minister by your power, by your grace, by your anointing to every single heart. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. I know I promised on Wednesday night Bible study to share a message with you called, I didn't think I'd be here, but God shifted that. And although the world is filled right now with, I didn't think I'd be here moments. We didn't think we'd be living through a pandemic. We didn't think we'd have to wear masks when we walk into the store. We didn't think that our economy would get hit. We didn't think that jobs would be lost. Maybe you didn't think you'd lose a loved one. I didn't think we'd be back online at our New Milford location for two weeks where the world is filled right now with, I didn't think I'd be here moments. I didn't think we'd experience racial divide in 2020 like we have right now. We'd, we didn't think that we'd be seeing a political environment like we have right now. Although our world right now is filled with, I didn't think I'd be here moments, really what's happening right now is contention is everywhere. And so I want to take this again as an opportunity to move you from being contentious about 
the things of the world to contending for the faith. And I've called this message, like you heard me say at the beginning, Hey Jude. And for those of you that are Beatles junkies, you know that that is a a song that was written by McCartney um, because one of John Lennon's sons was going through a difficult time. His name was Julian because John Lennon decided to leave his wife for the Japanese um, recording artist, artist Yoko Ono. And so he wrote this song to encourage Jules in a bad situation, in a sad situation, to continue to to look at the positive things in life and to go and find his own true love. And and so there was something in that that kind of just spoke to me because of the title, Hey Jude, because Jude in his book kind of shifts his message as well. He was planning to write to the church about one thing in his epistle, but then he noticed a sad situation that was happening in the church, and so the Lord shifted him to write about something else. Just like now, then the church or the gospel message, the purity of the gospel message was under attack. Even before it was officially penned for all of us to receive it, there was a war being waged against the purity of the gospel. Supposed spiritual leaders were twisting and altering and modifying the truth of the gospel to make it more culturally acceptable. And the church was in danger of losing the authenticity of the gospel because its leaders decided this is too difficult for people to take right now. The the culture around won't listen to what God has to say. So how can we modify? How can we twist? How can we change the scriptures so that people will kind of receive what we have to say more? And Jude was so taken by the situation that he actually shifted what he was about to write to the church and decided to write to them something else. Listen to what he says. He says, Beloved, well, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. In other words, I was going to write to you about how great a salvation we have, how, how wonderful our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. That was my intention. But then he said, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. I was going to write to you about this, but then I saw what was happening and I found it absolutely essential for me to shift and talk to you about the purity and maintaining the purity of the gospel. Let's dig into what he had to say. First of all, again, he said, I found it necessary. And this word means urgent. I found it something that needed to be addressed absolutely without delay. When I look out right now on the landscape and how hype people are about politics and how they're preaching, you know, more about their candidate, I find it necessary to compel the church to contend more for the Christ that they serve than the candidate that they want to see elected. I found it really necessary to say that. I know you want to put your hands together right now and say, hey, Jude, Jude is really getting up close and personal with the church because they're shifting, they're moving away from spiritual truth. He goes on, he says in verse, the next part of the verse, he says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you. This was a military term, this word exhortation. And a commanding officer would gather around the troops when the troops were ready to go into battle. And uh, instead of denying the reality of the battle that was ahead of them, and instead of denying the reality of the, the, the danger that was out there, the commanding officer would rally the troops around and he would, he would tell them straightforward that even though it's going to be difficult, you need to stand tall. And here's what God is saying, that no matter who gets elected, in these end times, we are going to have to stand tall on the word of God. We are going to have to stand tall on the principles of God's word, despite the politics and the political division that is going on. It's going to get hairy out there. And then Jude says this, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly, contend earnestly. This is a wrestling term. And it literally describes two wrestlers that are putting every ounce of energy that they have into subduing the other person. There's this this war going on. They're using all their skills. They want to get their opponent to the ground. They want to force their opponent into submission. And, And the message is this. Are we doing that for the gospel? And do we understand who our opponent is? Are we all in 
for the gospel? Are we having more gospel discussions than political discussions? Are we posting more spiritual truths than we are political talking points? Are we trying to persuade people to surrender their life to the Savior more than we're trying to persuade them on who they should vote for and who they shouldn't? Are we sharing the good news with people or are we sharing the fake news with people? Are we exerting every ounce of energy in an effort to evangelize the lost and let our light shine? And do we know who our opponent is? Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen to me, church. The enemy is not the left or the right. It's not each other. It's not the police. It's not politicians. The enemy is the one who is pulling on our political heartstrings in order to go unnoticed. Do we know who our enemy really is? Jude continues. He said, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly. Notice this, for the faith, not for a political platform, not for a certain better today or better tomorrow, although we all want a better today and a better tomorrow. The faith here refers to the long-held, time-tested spiritual truths of Scripture. I want to take a moment in this time of political contention and wrestling to remind the church that the real battle that is going on is to disqualify scriptural truth, to make it outdated and irrelevant and untrue. I want to take this moment to remind everyone that our role is to remain steadfast in our stand for what the scripture says. If it's scriptural truth, it doesn't matter which political party sides with it. It is our job to side with the scriptures. Jude was warning the church that a spiritual disease was invading the people of God to distort the truth of scripture that had been taught to them and that they needed to above all else defend and contend for the faith. Jude was telling them not to bend, not to compromise, not to concede, not to conform, but to contend, to contend. Here's our job. What does the scripture say is right and wrong? To contend for scriptural standards of morality, to contend for scriptural standards of justice and judgments. To contend doesn't mean to bend, it means to stand strong. Jude is really getting in the face of the church. And he's telling, in these times, you need to contend in church, in these end times. This is our series, Alternate Universe. Everywhere we look, seems crazy. How do we contend for the faith? I want to give you a couple of things. Number one, don't deviate from the word of God. Notice again what Jude continues to say. He says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which, notice this, once and for all was delivered to the saints. Once and for all. This phrase describes something that is complete and needs nothing else to be added to it. In other words, the Word of God, here's what Jude is telling them, it doesn't need alterations, it doesn't need amendments, it doesn't need improvements, it doesn't need modifications, it doesn't need revelation to be added to it. It has been delivered once and for all. It is perfect, it is powerful, it is authoritative, it is complete, and it and it alone is life-changing. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 4 puts it this way. God means what he says. What he says goes. His powerful word is as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. Now, I love this part. Nothing and no one is impervious to God's word. We can't get away from it no matter what. In other words, We shouldn't alter the word because it and it alone has the power to pierce the heart of people in its unadulterated form, in its unculturally modified and and not mishandled form. It is authoritative, powerful, and unstoppable. Matter of fact, James tells us that the word of God without man-made alterations or cultural relevancy added to it can solve man's greatest problem, and that is save 
our souls. In this world where people are just confused, the Word of God pierces through all of that and deals with the soul. And because it's able to solve mankind's greatest problem, the sin problem, God tells us, don't you dare alter it. Matter of fact, Revelation 22, verse 18, For I testified to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. Over and over again, God says, it's perfect all by itself. It doesn't need you to make people like it. It doesn't need you to alter it. It doesn't need you to soften it. It doesn't mean, just just keep it in the form that God has given it to us. So number one, if we are going to contend for the faith, don't deviate from the word of God. But then number two, do deliver it. Notice what Jude says. Jude chapter 1, second part of verse 3. Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The word delivered means to be given to somebody for self-safekeeping. It means to hand something to someone so that they will hand it to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation in the exact condition that it was given to them in. When I think about delivered, what this word means for safekeeping, I think about family traditions. And you all know family traditions, in order to be passed down from one generation to the next, requires that somebody would take enough care to make sure that the next generation would know about it. And when I think about family traditions, I think about my grandmother's pizza rustica. Now, some of you aren't Italian, you don't know nothing about pizza rustica, but this is just the best holiday pie you ever want to taste in your entire life. It's made with all sorts of cheeses and all sorts of dried salamis. I mean, it is just amazing in every way. I know this recipe so well that within the first bite, I could tell if somebody altered that recipe. I could tell by looking at the pizza rustica if somebody changed that recipe. Just just visually looking at that thing. And my grandmother gave it to my mother, the recipe. My mother passed it on to my sisters and my wife and myself. And hopefully we will pass it on to our kids and they will pass it on to their kids because we don't want a generation to go by who misses out on the goodness of pizza rustica. Here's my question. What will happen to the next generation of believers? Will they know the word of God like it's been delivered to us? Will they know about the blood? Will they know about the cross? Will they know about righteousness and justification? Will they know about the promises? Will they know about godly morality? Will they know about heaven? Will they know about hell? Will they know how to get to heaven and hell? Will they know the word of God like it's been passed down to you and I? Will we be saints who who take seriously the fact that God has delivered to us the Word of God in the form He wanted it to be in? And will we keep it safe for the next generation? Will we be saints who stay trustworthy and take serious the words that have been spoken long ago? Listen to Deuteronomy chapter number 11, verse 18. Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of heavens above the earth. I don't know about you, but the legacy that I want to leave my kids, I don't want to leave my kids, although I do. It's not the primary legacy. I don't want to leave my kids the legacy of wealth. That's not my primary objective, although I I want to do that. My primary objective is, is not to leave them the legacy of fame. It's not to leave them those kind of things, worldly things. God, praise the Lord if that happens. But my primary objective is to leave them the legacy of the Word of God as it was delivered to us, a generation that has been entrusted with it. Because here's the thing I know, that's what is going to be able to keep them when I can't. That's the thing that's going to be able to protect them when I can't, to heal them, when I can't, to provide for them, when I can't, to lift them, when I can't, to keep them grounded, when I can't, to keep their head on straight and the world gone crazy, when I can't, ultimately, to get them to heaven when I'm gone. Will we be that generation 
that contends for the faith in these contentious times. And then the third thing and the last thing I want to share with you, how do we contend for the faith? Do not be defined by the wrong dot. Do not be defined by the wrong dot. I've told this story before, um, but it's so appropriate. I, the Lord really just said, I want you to tell this story again. It's a story of Eli and his wooden masterpiece, Punchinello. And here's how it goes. It was written by Max Lucado. He said, the Wemmicks were small wooden people. All the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking the village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses and large eyes. and Some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats and others coats. But all were made by the same carver and all lived in the same village. And all day, every day, the Wemmicks did something. They, they gave dots and stickers, dots and stars, stickers to one another. Each Wemmick had a box of golden star stickers and a box of gray dot stickers up and down the streets all over the city. People spent their days sticking stars and dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth and fine paint, they always got stars. But if the wood was roughed or, or the paint was chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented ones, they got stars too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump on over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs and everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks, Wemmicks had stars all over them and every time they got a star, it made them feel so good about themselves. It made them want to do something else to get another star. Others though, could do little and they got dots. Punchinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like others, but he was always falling. And when he fell, the others would gather around and they'd give him dots. And sometimes when he fell, he would get scratched so people would give him more dots. And then when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly and the Wemmicks would give him more dots. And after a while, he had so many dots, they didn't want to go outside anymore. He was afraid he would do something dumb such as forget his hat or step in water and the people would give him another dot. In fact, he had so many gray dots that some people would come up to him, give him a dot just because he had dots. One day he met a Wemmick who was unlike anyone he had ever met. She had no dots or stars. Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her dots and stars, but they didn't stick. That's the way that I want to be, Punchinello thought. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day, I go see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the wood carver. I sit in the workshop with him. Well, well, why don't you go find out for yourself? Go up the hill, he's there. And with that, the Wemmick, who had no stickers, turned and skipped away. So P Punchinello decided to go see Eli. He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and he stepped into the big shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on his tiptoes just to see over the top of the workbench. A hammer as long as his arm. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. And he turned to leave and then he heard his name, Punchinello. The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. You know my name, he asked. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and he picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm. Looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really, really tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself with me, child. I don't care what the other Wemmicks think about you. You don't? No. And you shouldn't either. Who are they to give you stars and dots? They're Wemmicks just like you. When they think, what they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you're pretty, pretty special. With that, a dot dropped off of Punchinello. When I read that story and, and thought of what's happening in our world, I thought our world has created a culture of dots and stars. And, and who and when gets the dots and the stars changes from generation to generation as truth evolves and becomes relative and progressive and personal worth morphs and changes. Dots and stars are given depending upon your sexuality, depending upon the color of your skin, depending upon the size of your bank account, depending upon the location of your residence, and now depending upon your political affiliation.
And people all around are caught up in the dot and the star system that they'll do anything to get a star and avoid a dot. The reason? They've forgotten their identity. Mankind has forgotten that they, each and every one of us on the planet is a masterpiece of Almighty God crafted from the dust of the ground with His careful hands and made in His image and in His likeness. Crafted while we were in our mother's womb according to the extraordinary specifications that God thought would fit us best. And because our identity as masterpieces of Almighty God has been marred and masked by a satanic plot that has made its way from one generation to the next, mankind goes around searching for dots and stars. What a sad search. That could easily be rectified if we would turn to the very Savior who created us and made us in His image in his likeness, knowing every single one of us by name. But sadly, the search for stars and dots is not just out there in the world, it's made its way into the body of Christ. And specifically, as we stand on the horizon of the most contentious election, perhaps in American history, the church thinks they are taking stars and giving dots by their affiliation with a political party. Political parties whose affiliations have changed, over time and throughout American history and have been related and uh, sided with all sorts of sordid and misguided values. Some think they're getting stars by pronouncing themselves to be Democrats. Others think they're getting stars by pronouncing themselves to be Republicans and I'll take my star because I lean left and I'll take my star because I lean right. And what we think is a star in God's eyes is nothing more than a scar and in reality it's a dot. It's a dot against the dignity of who God has designed us to be. It's a dot against the wonder of the cross. It's a dot against the new creations in Christ that we have become when at the cross, at the cross, we first saw the light. It's a dot that mars who we are supposed to see when we look into the perfect law of liberty. It's a dot that we're supposed to see when we go through the refiner's fire and reflect back the image of Jesus Christ. So God brought me here this weekend on the horizon of the most contentious election in modern history, to remind the church to contend for the faith by refusing to take a political dot, but rather to proudly declare that they have been given the greatest title that can ever be ascribed to humankind, and that is Christian. Not Democrat, not Republican, not liberal, not conservative, not left, not right. Christian, here's what it means. Christ like one. Don't let the meaning of the term scare you off. You didn't give it to you. God gave it to you. And I understand that wearing that title, walking in that title, carries with it a a certain inherent accountability to represent the Christ that you say you're like. And perhaps that's why we would rather be labeled Democrat and Republican. Because then I don't have to necessarily represent Jesus Christ. Here's what God told me to tell you, that if we are going to contend for the faith, that we have to own the label and wear it proudly and loudly, not by words or judgments or arguments or being part of the political zoo, but we have to do it by carrying his message to the world that is watching and that is needing truth that transcends the craziness of the time. Here's what God said. Don't wear the dot carry the title. How did we get the title Christians? I'm going to say this and then close. Acts chapter 11, verse 25. Then Barnabas departed for Tarshish to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it was, it, and so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. You all know the story because I preached on it a few weeks back, but, but the early church rejected Saul. They didn't think somebody who had sinned like he sinned could possibly be a saint. They, they doubted whether his conversion was really real, and so they rejected him, and, and so he, he was pushed out of the church. And Barnabas saw beyond 
who used to be, to who God called him to be. And so Barnabas went all the way to Tarsus and he got Saul and he brought him back to the church in Antioch. And finally the church received him. Finally they looked beyond the sin and they received him as a person. And listen to it. And after that, the church was first called Christians. After that, the disciples were first called Christians. After they received the rejected, after they welcomed the ostracized, after they forgave the one who had sinned against them, after they saw beyond who Saul was and who God could create him to be, after they did that, then they were called Christians. Church, that's our mission. That's our life's work. That's our high calling. That is the mark of a true Christian who contends for the faith by guiding people out of their confusion to the foot of the cross. Don't you dare dot me with a political label, I'm a Christian. Here's the thing about hopefully you and me. I'm a Christian before Tuesday. I'll be a Christian after Tuesday because no election can change me. Jesus already has. Don't wear the dot. Wear the title. You're a Christian. Let's contend for the faith in these end times. For those of you that are watching at home, watching at our campuses, I want to give you the opportunity to trade your dot for a divine identity. Whatever dot the world has put on you, the greatest dot that's been put on us is our, the dot of our sin. And we need to trade that dot in and get an identity in our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's real simple. Here's how you do it. You just say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I accept you as my Savior. And when you do, you become a Christian. That becomes who you are. That becomes what you do. That becomes how you act. I want to encourage the Christians right now. After Tuesday, act like a Christian. We certainly haven't been acting like Christians before Tuesday. And the pressure is going to be on after Tuesday, depending upon the outcome, to either act like a Christian or not act like a Christian. Here's what I've determined. No matter what happens in the world, I'm going to stay with Jesus. I'm going to act like Him. Have you traded your dot for an identity in Christ? Do you know if you were to die this moment, this, sec this second, where you'd spend eternity? If God is speaking to your heart, I want you to pray this with me right there at home. Heavenly Father, Today I give you my life. I repent of my sins. I put my faith in Jesus Christ and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the greatest identity in the world. You're a Christian. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Reach out. There's a little button on your screen. It says, I gave my life to Jesus. Hit it. We'll, re we'll reach out to you. We'll help you in your journey with the Lord. If you're watching on a platform that doesn't have the button, you can type the word Jesus. If you're at a campus, you know, see your campus pastor. They'll give you some further instructions. Whatever you do, if you just gave your life to Jesus, make sure you get in church. Make sure you watch us online next week. New Milford online only the week after. Back in action at all of our locations. Our locations are actually open now. The only one that's not is New Milford, but on the 14th and 15th, we are going to be back in action for a special weekend where we all bring our special offerings to the Lord and bless some organizations in our community. I love you. I'll see you again real soon. Thanks so much for watching, but don't just stop there. Click the watch live button in the description below to join us for Faith Church Online every Sunday morning. And while you're there, you can set a reminder to come back Sundays at 9 and 11. If you'd also like to learn more about getting involved here at Faith Church, you can click the connect button. And be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video and maybe even share it with a friend. Thank you again for watching. And as always, remember with Jesus, you are destined to win.